Now, the research part of this. Let me explain the research. The research points are given each year, depending on certain factors. And when I actually need to do it in 1940, I'll go over it more. But in 39, the Germans, as you can see, get five research points, the Italians two, and the Germans and Italians can combine the research points, so they can get a total of seven. Now you have five different categories that you can research in. The air category, and there's a bunch of stuff there. The naval category, and there's a bunch of stuff there. The military category, and there's a bunch of stuff there. The atomic category, and the intelligence category. So within each category, you're allowed to put half of your total research points and you can round up. So if the axes have seven in 1939, they can put a total of four in any one of those categories. Now, once you're within the categories, each separate little research item, you can only put three research points in total. So, for the axis in 1939, I pick military general. That's just the, that's a general category. It goes under military. You see 1939, I have a one there. General means if I can succeed in researching that, I get a plus one to all my die rolls for anything in the military category. So, I like going for that because the Germans are going to be using a lot of military. I put one into winter preparation. Remember, that is for the Russian front. Then the intelligence one. The intelligence one is very important for all countries. We put two in the covert operations, one in occupation policies, and one in the Muslim unrest policy. Now you can see here Remember, I could put four in the, any one categories. I put one, two, three, four in the intelligence category. And remember, you can't have more than three than in each item. Now, you're probably wondering what the roll and the save is. You can pick one item to roll each year. And when you roll it, those RPs are spent. And no matter what result you get, they're spent. Sometimes, if you save your research points, you can carry them over to the next year. And then you get to add them to a die roll you make. So it's sort of like you're building up the points over and over. Covert, I am going to roll. And occupation policies, I'm going to save. And Muslim unrest, I'm going to save. Now as the game goes on, I'll keep explaining this stuff and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Right. The allies get six total. Here's the air category, and I put one in strategic bombers. Now, I stick with the strategic bombing because they already start with, as you can see here, a plus five. So I might as well continue in the strategic bombers, and we might as well get them because as soon as we get close enough to Japan, we're going to start hammering them. Okay, the next category is naval and I got two into the flexible deployment and I'm gonna save that I'm not rolling for that right now just like yours I'm not rolling for I'm just gonna start adding in the research points those are modifiers again you get on your die roll flexible deployment is I think absolutely crucial for the Americans what, what this does is when the Americans SR the Americans have to start in this US box they can SR initial deployments to Hawaii, and I'll talk about initial deployments more later. Or they can initial deploy down to the South Pacific box. This represents everything off the board. And then it comes around to Australia. Now this takes at least three turns and maybe even four just to get them ready to fight in Australia. So flexible, flexible deployment cuts that in half from America to the South Pacific box. You don't have to wait a turn with flexible deployment. And then you go over to Australia. So flexible deployment as Americans is critical for Australia. Okay, in the military category, category, I have nothing yet. The atomic, you know, I'm just not a big atomic guy. You know, you can throw all your stuff in there and try to get the atomic bomb. But 
To me, you have to concentrate on defeating the army first, and we can always worry about this later. In the intelligence category, I like going for the Anglo-French cooperation. Remember in the old Third Reich games that the French and the English did not have Anglo-French cooperation? And the British air can only protect the British units and they couldn't stack together. It made it so easy for the Germans to conquer France. Well, now, if you give them uh, cooperation, it is so difficult. Now the Germans have to deal with the British and the French air force together. And you can now stack British tanks with French tanks. And that becomes important when, it, when you're talking about breakthroughs, which I'll talk about later. For the Russians... They get three research points. We don't put anything in the air. We're not worried about air. Now the military, they're going to do a lot on, so we're going into general, and we're going to roll for that the first time, first chance we get. And the intelligence category, we're going for subversion. Subversion allows the Russians to subvert any minor allied country that is bordering a controlled minor country they have or Russia proper so for example they can try to subvert Finland or Romania to start with to me Romania is most important is more important than Finland and I will try to subvert that the only thing with subverting that is it allows the Germans to gain uh, Romanian as an ally a lot easier if I fail to subvert. But if I succeed in subverting, this will make it very difficult for the Germans to gain it as an ally or even get it on its side if the Russians can subvert it. So why not try? Because they only have three research points. And for the categories that I'm looking at for Russians, mainly military, I can get the... the uh, items I want and still spare these two especially if I can get Romania so that's why I try to subvert them. the Japanese get three research points we don't put any in the air right now none in the naval the military we're gonna put two for the force pull of infantry remember Japanese are very short on infantry and so we want to get the extra infantry. So that's what we go for. We're going to put two in and we're going to roll right away. Then we're going to put one in Chinese occupation. Because we're after, you know, Russia and we got to deal with the Americans, we don't want Chinese to be giving us a lot of problems. So we're going to try to pacify them with this Chinese occupation. So that's the Japanese RP. The research points we will call RPs from this point on. So the RPs are done. You move to the diplomatic phase. In the diplomatic phase, and we'll call these DPs from now on, the axes get five. The ones we defend ourselves against is the Belgium, Luxembourg. I put one in Denmark. I put one in Poland, Romania, and the United States. The reason for this is... And the reason we say defend next to them is because when you put DPs in a country, you can use your covert operations there. So let's say, for example, you I have one DP in Belgium. The Allies pick Belgium to diplomatically change their status. And they put three DPs in there. Well, three minus my one leaves them with a plus two to their dice but I have if I have covert operations I can now eliminate some more of their DPs and so that's why I get covert operations to help protect myself against the diplomatic moves that the Allies will make but you can't use your covert operations if you unless you have a DP in that country also if you pick the country to change the status you can't use your covert operations. Only the other guy can use his covert operations against you. So he has to pick Belgium for me to use my covert. So that's why it says defend. I don't want to pick Belgium at all. I don't want to pick Poland. I don't want to pick Romania. Those are all there to defend. If he picks them, I can use my covert operations against them. 
Now, the United States is the only one I'm going to pick because the DPs I put in there, I can drop the tension table. And we'll get to that right after this. But that's my DPs. It's mainly just a protection for 39. Now, for the Allies, they put three into Belgium. Remember, remember, we're going for Anglo-French cooperation, and if we can get Belgium on our side, wow, the Western Front is going to be tough for the Germans. The Allies need to make it as tough as possible for the Germans in the beginning. They want to economically hurt them if they can. Then, we like to put two in Poland, and in case the Germans try to go after Poland, we protect that, or you can just put one in Poland and one in the United States. That's about all we do with the Allies. I'm going to go two for Poland. The Russians, they have two diplomatic points. They put one in Russia. Remember, you can, you can only put half of your diplomatic points in one category in, this, in the diplomatic phase. So the Russians have two, so they can only put one into Romania. Remember, that's the country you're going to try to subvert. So... They want as most as many DPZs, DPs in there as they can get. Well, they can only put one. And then Russia itself, they can put one. Even nobody, nobody can pick Russia in 1939 to diplomatically change its status. However, there's a thing called the reaction die roll. Whenever the Germans do something that changes, that can change the status of the Russian modifier in the allies favor then there's a Russian reaction die roll and you roll the die immediately and you get to apply any diplomatic points that you put in there so in case the Germans do something that triggers the reaction die roll the Russians put one diplomatic point in there now the R Russians and Americans or the allies they can't combine their diplomatic points in certain countries and it, it says down here at the bottom where they can be combined and where they can't be combined. So it's self-explanatory there. But in Russia, they can't be combined. So that's why the Allies don't mess with it. They just let the Russians put one in there. Okay, so that's the diplomatic phase done. So this is a copy of the Global War Rules and Scenarios. It's this booklet that tells you how to set up the global war game it tells you all the forces you get to start with and then your allowable builds that is as the turns and years go by you get to add more army units to your force pull which you can buy and then get on the board so this is the scenario booklet that you use to set up we move to the order of deployment the first country that sets up is Poland now remember we want to make it as difficult as Ger for the Germans as possible to take out anything. We want to make them pay in money. We want to make them lose troops. If we give Germany 3 to 1 attacks, it's pretty easy for them. We want to make them make 2 to 1 attacks. Now with this setup, the Germans can overrun a unit here and use these two hexes and make a 2 to 1 attack on Warsaw. Well, that's the best we can do. We want them to do two to one attacks. Now, the Polish, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Belgians, the Dutch, the French, their job is to make the Germans lose as many pieces as possible. So we try to find the best setup. Now, let me explain an overrun. Right here on the Polish 1-3, all units are doubled on defense, so that becomes a 2. To overrun a unit, you need to have 6 to 1 odds. So with that 2, you have to have 12 factors. One of them has to be an armor unit. So with the Germans, you put a 4-6 tank and a 3-3 infantry unit, that's 7. Then it costs you 5 air factors for 12. And that's how you overrun that hex. Then once you conduct the overrun, the Germans would have to roll one dice. If you get a one, you have to lose a unit. So the Germans will usually take out the 3-3 three, three infantry unit. And there start your losses. So if the pull is set up like this, the Germans will overrun this one unit, and then they got to roll a dice, maybe lose some. They'll take a 2-1 to one on the next hex, and then exploit to the capital for a 3-1. to one. This setup, 
would allow basically the same thing. We move that unit from there back where the 2 3 is. The Germans would overrun the 1 3 and have to roll a dice, maybe lose something. Then with the two hexes here, they would stack infantry and an infantry and a tank and attack the next hex at 2 to 1 odds. Then they will exploit to the capital for 3 to 1 odds. So either way you look at it, I like this, this one or the other setup because they have to make three attacks. Otherwise, if they just want to do one attack, they will overrun the 1-3 back there and they will stack their units on those two hexes and attack the capital across the river. Across the river, he defends at triple. So it'll be a two to one attack one time. And if the Germans roll an exchange, the Germans have to lose their doubled uh, defense of the Polish units, their doubled value. That's how much the Germans have to lose. So I don't think they would do that. That's why I leave that one hex open. I would like them to take that two to one. But this is probably how uh, I'll just leave it and the Germans will make three attacks. This is Germany's setup. Now, let's take a look at the units for now. You see the first numbers? The first numbers are the attack and defense of the unit. The second number is the movement. And then each unit has its own uh, military symbol on it to symbolize what it is. So for example, sitting right here, you have armored units. With that little circle, that means it's an armored unit. So those are tanks. They're four, six tanks. And then you will see air units. That's an air unit. Its attack is a five and its movement is a four. That is to say from an air base, which is any city or port or artificial air base you put down, like this one, that's an artificial air base, you can fly four hexes out, attack, support a ground offensive, and then fly back to your base. Air units are the dominant role in this game. Okay, the infantry unit is a 3-3. Three, three. First number attack and defense, second number movement. The three infantries are the most powerful on the board. The Germans got a lot of them, and so do the Russians. The 4-6 tank is the most powerfulest. The air units can be broken down. The, the most air wing you can have, the strongest air wing you can have is a 5-4. Besides that, you can break them down into any way you want. Like I broke this one down. There's a 3-4 here. Well, the 2-4 is over here. That represents a full 5-4. That's one air wing. So you can never have more than air factors on the board than you're allowed. The game comes with a force pull card. This is Germany's Global War game card. It tells you the BRP level it starts with, its growth rate, its SR limits, and its basic DP allocations. It starts with 150 points. Here is its at start forces, two fleets, 20 army air factors, four four six tanks, and eight three three infantry. In the fall of 39, they can add, so in the first turn, already in their force pull, that they can build from in the first uh, build phase is another fleet, 10 more army air factors, eight more tanks, one paratrooper and 20 more infantry and eight replacements and I'll get to the replacements when we deal with them. The infantry units I like putting on the Maginot line because if we don't put units there when the French set up they can put a they can put a tank right here and they exert zone of control into these hexes when you build units you can never place units in a zone of control and therefore I wouldn't be able to place units on the Maginot line and it gives France a little opening where they can start cutting into Germany. So I start three right there to protect against that. The air base is here and the tanks are all here in case to keep the French honest basically. If the French leave Paris weak and they put their armies you know somewhere else like they're gonna go on another adventure I can always take my air units and my tanks come down through here and come in this way through France or even across the Maginot line, depending how the French setup is. 
but it's basically to keep the French honest. So they put their entire army right in this area to protect Paris. That's what they should do, and that's what we want them to do. I always keep some men loaded if I can. Loaded means these 3-3 infantry are loaded up on ships. They're underneath them. They're on the same port. They have to start the turn in the same hex, and then I can conduct seaborne invasions or sea transports. So it keeps the British honest of what I'm doing here. These forces here have to be next to the Polish army because they're going to have to start the attack. That's why they're sitting here around Poland. But if the French setup is good, these forces will eventually go this way and help in the Polish attack. Now let me explain zone of control. Zone of control is with armor units. That means the armor unit here, every hex around the armor unit, the six hexes, the, that army unit exerts a zone of control. That means you can't move through here or by this army unit without using extra movement points. It costs three movement points to move in to a zone of control hex. So an infantry would go three and then stop. Next turn three and then stop. So it takes them forever to get around an army unit. So zone of controls are very important. And zone of controls is what makes the armor unit so tough. Okay, and that brings us to our second uh, ruling of exploitation, breakthroughs and exploitations, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But that's where you pile up, you pick a weak point in the enemy line, you have an army unit there, one army unit has to create the breakthrough, you have the other armor units adjacent to that, you attack the hex, succeed in destroying the units, and you can move every armor unit you have in that hex from that hex, they can exploit two hexes out in a chain. So the first armor unit can go two, second armor at two, third armor at two, and that's how you get behind the enemy line and you cut off the enemy. And the Germans having so many four six tanks, very powerful tanks, they're very good at it. And you cover the tanks with your air power. So that is the German setup. Those are a couple of the rules, and we'll get into it and I'll show you how it's done. You can start on the initial setup one air base in your country. After that, each turn you're allowed to place one air base on the board anywhere you want, subject to some limitations, such as they have to be in a supplied controlled hex and they can't be an enemy ZOC. Remember, ZOC is the acronym we are using for zone of control. Now, besides that, every turn you can place one air base counter up to the limits of the air base counters that you actually have. Like for example, Germany has four. So each turn they can place one. After they're all on the board, you can always pick one up and put it anywhere you want on the board somewhere else, subject to the limitations. One a turn. So each turn you can place an air base or pick one air base up from somewhere else on the board and put it somewhere else. Other than that, the only way to move an air base is by S arming. So you can pick one up, move it during any time during your turn, and put it somewhere else. And then during the SR phase, if you need to move an airbase, you can move an airbase like that. So that's the rules on the airbase. Remember, every city, port, and airbase can base five army air factors. So air bases become very crucial in the war. So sometimes you attack just in a city area to take a city so you can base air bases so you can base your airplane so this is the Italian setup now in the scenario uh, initial setup rules you have to look for the limitations some units have for example the Italians have to start a 1-3 infantry unit in Albania and they have to start two infantry units at least down here in Libya. So here's the setup. The problem with Italy is once you go to war, the British, because of Malta, will harass and prevent Italian units from reaching down here in Libya where we need to put pressure on Egypt. So I try to get as many units as I can down into Africa before we go to war. And that's why you'll see 
I put the most I could down here without leaving Italy too weak. So you'll see three one threes. Now you remember the Germans have three three infantry units. They got like twenty eight of them. The Italians only have two. So you can see how much weaker this army is. They have six one three infantry corps. So I put three of them on the border with Britain, and I put the Libyan corps on Tripoli. The Albanian corps that we already looked at sits here with a nine fleet because that nine fleet is going to take it off we don't want we don't need it in Albania we can definitely use it elsewhere the three fleets the Italians have one goes in there to Albania the other two go in Toronto we remember to keep your fleets out of range of any allied air because if they start bombing them man that kills us so keep your fleets out of uh, air strike range now this beach in southern Italy is very important and that's why I put my strongest unit on it a 3-3 the Allies are allowed to invade a normal invasion seven hexes away from any controlled hex they have well they've got Malta here they've got uh, Corsica here with France so this can be invaded so we protect it heavily the Airplane is going to help protect the beach while simultaneously protecting this 2-5 tank. We put a 1-3 here and a 3-3 on the front line with the French. Now this is a partial setup because the Italians go before the French. So they're allowed to build, take their turn and they can build. This is their allowable build. So they can build a lot of this and we can get it on the board. So after the Italians first turn, we're going to fill a lot of these gaps. But the whole point with the Italians is you have to protect against the turn flip-flop. Now the turn flip-flop, let me explain this. It's part of the game. Whoever has the most BRPs between the Allies and the Axes each turn gets to go first. So theoretically, you could get two turns in a row. You can go last in one turn, and then in the next turn, you can end up going first, thus giving you two turns in a row. In the Third Reich, we call that a turn flip-flop. Some, tur some turn flip-flops, you can't um, stop, and you can't prevent. But others, you can, so we try to keep an eye on that. For example, in the first year here in 39, we can't prevent the Allies taking a turn flip-flop if they want to. And the only reason the Allies will take a turn flip-flop most of the time is if they see Italy weak and they think they can conquer Rome. I've seen it happen many times. So our whole defense is to keep Rome from getting conquered in a turn flip-flop. And that's what you will see the setup. After the Italians go, you will see the final setup and shift. Sometimes I just put units somewhere to, just to throw the Allies off. But when the Italians go first, I move things around where I want them. So that's the initial setup. And the Italians are done.